Welcome to episode 119. I'm your host, Gustavo Dantas, and today we have Pedro Sauer. Pedro is eighth degree coral belt in jiu-jitsu under Hicks and Gracie. He has one of the biggest associations in the world, the Pedro Sauer Association, with over 150 affiliates. He was one of the first Brazilians to migrate to the United States to share jiu-jitsu, so this was late 80s, early 90s. So he talked about cool stories back then, especially early days training with Grandmaster Elio Gracie and Hicks and Gracie. So it was a really cool interview. So before we get to the interview, just share a few things with you. One is last week I had the opportunity to interview Fabio Gurgel. Oh, for those who don't know, I do have a podcast in Portuguese as well. And Fabio, for people who don't know, he is one of the founders of the Team Alliance. He's a jiu-jitsu legend. He's in the Hall of Fame of the IBJJF for Black Belt World Titles, an incredible coach. So it was a really cool interview. And it's interesting that Pedro was sharing a story between uh, Fabio and Hickson that he witnessed. And that was cool that Fabio was talking about the same experience from you know, his point of view. But apparently this this happens this happened in some somewhere in the early 90s when he went to visit Hickson in LA for I don't know if it was the first time or first time have trained a long time. I don't know. But he mentioned to Pedro, yeah, I haven't been challenged yet at my school for some time, haven't tapped in a while. And Pedro said, Well, this is about to change tonight. <laughs> And it, it did change. So that was really cool. His, he, Fabio spoke highly about him, how, tech, he, how technically far ahead of everyone he was back then. And Pedro sharing stories too. So it's really cool. I uh, hope you, you guys enjoyed the interview. Now, still talking about Fabio, I want to share some jujitsu history with you. Sometimes I forget. <laughs> I've seen so many things and been training and started, I started in 1989. So around that time in Brazil, late 80s and 90s, there was a lot of like street fights and jiu-jitsu had a really bad reputation in Rio. I can say for Brazil, because I mean, the, the hot spot for jiu-jitsu was Rio. However, until 1991, jiu-jitsu was not well known in Brazil as maybe people think that everyone knew until the, the 1991, there's a special event called uh, Vale Tudo. Vale Tudo, that means for people who don't know, no holds bar, anything goes, no time limit or gloves or whatnot. And Fabio Gurgel was part of this event that took place in 1991 that really changed the direction of jiu-jitsu in Brazil. So I want to share a little bit of the story. So, so I asked him about, about this event. And how was the experience? So all this started, I guess, some, some, somewhere around that time, Valide Ismail. Valide Ismail, back then, he was a brown belt under Carson Gracie. Eventually, for people maybe are familiar with, with him, fought MMA, fought a, even, I think, fought in UFC and, and Pride. But he's the one that competed against Hoist Gracie and ended up actually winning, uh, choking him, uh, choking him out and, and stuff. So he got some, uh, I think he got a little more got more notice when when this happened but anyway this this match with hoist was in 1998 so this was back in 1991 so he went to the press and he was he put out an open challenge that jiu-jitsu was the best martial art and that's kind of how things were in, in the 90s in the last time they had a value to in rio it was 1984 and hicks and gracie fought and there was Hickson's, I, I believe it was Hickson's last fight in Brazil. So they had no fights in Rio for a long time. So Valigia went, to, Valigia went to the press and he always had really good marketing. He was, he, he was a talker and he always find himself in TVs and stuff. And then he put the, the challenge out. And then the Luta Livre group. So Luta Livre is basically no gi grappling. And a lot of guys that practice other martial arts, especially stand-up arts and stuff. And so there was the rivalry back then was the gi, no gi type of deal. And, and they actually got a big group and went to a jiu-jitsu tournament called Copa Nastra. And they took a bunch of people and kind of invaded the tournament. And 
but they nothing happened and no fight broke out there but that's where they decided okay we we'll, we'll accept the challenge and this is going to happen so the so the fight so they scheduled four fights and that was back in uh, so the date was sit, uh, September 26 1991 and they scheduled four fights unfortunately one of the fights one of the fighters got injured and dropped out so those three fights so i was 16 back then i was a brand new blue belt and i remember i lived about 15 minute walking from from the venue called grajaú country club and my family was a member of that and i couldn't could go there so um just a place that they have pools and a court and stuff like that but anyways uh i couldn't get in and there's like thousands of people outside and inside packed and i couldn't really watch so i went back home and then the biggest TV channel in Brazil called Global actually broadcast that maybe a, an hour later or something from when the fight happened. And that was a huge deal because that was the biggest channel in Brazil. And so the first fight was Vali Ismail against Eugenio Tadeu. Eugenio actually fought in UFC at one point. Old school guy. He was part of the 1984 uh, Vali Tudo in Rio too, so super tough dude. And the fight was the most violent one. And that was just, the funny thing is that listening to the commentators and, and they talk about the rules before they say it's supposed to be open hand. <laughs> and that was like from the gecko, they're like punching and, and headbutt and, and the announcer saying like, wow, they're not supposed to be doing uh close fist as Valid just like headbutting him so that was pretty funny and it was a brutal fight and Valid won so you just won the first one and then second was Murilo Bustamante what people don't know Murilo is a legend at one point he was the UFC uh middleweight champion I believe and jiu-jitsu world champion one of yeah, one of the best ever in jiu-jitsu so he was super calm I actually interviewed him before uh, maybe a few months ago, I interviewed him in Portuguese too. So I did ask about this event. So he talked about he completely dominated the fight. So it was 2-0. And then the, the third fight was Fabio Gugel. Fabio Gugel against Denilson Maia, I believe his name. Big dude. And and Fabio, it looked incredible. He was It was kind of like the most technical, even though I think he finished from strikes from the mount. But like how he showed he, how great jiu his jiu-jitsu was so jiu-jitsu won all three matches and after that jiu-jitsu skyrocketed in rio that was really what really took off because people did, really didn't know and now two years after hoist in the ufc so now the word got out and more about jiu-jitsu in in us into the world with the ufc 1993 also they had the very first brazilian national jiu-jitsu tournament that was not by cbjj yet it was actually my coach under Pedro promoted 1994 cbjj was created the first official nationals 1996 or the very first ibjf worlds and that's where we are at right now and all started really the a huge spark it was the 1991 Vale Tudo. And it's so cool for me to have opportunity to interview those guys that participate in how tense, you know, imagine it's not like how it is today. There was like, it, there's no really much money involved. It was just pride and it was crazy. So now imagine if all three guys from Jiu Jitsu lost and then two years later, Hoist lost. I don't know if you'd be training jiu-jitsu right now, I'll tell you what, because things would be very different. So we definitely need to be appreciative of everyone who paved the way, who really fought and got put their face there to, to get where jiu-jitsu is today and respect. That's why, in my, especially in my jiu-jitsu podcast in Portuguese, I interview a lot of the old school guys that people don't know about it. They're the, the stars in the 80s and 90s that people don't know. And people forgetting the incredible guys that paved the way to be where we at today. So hopefully you enjoy this little bit of jujitsu history. That's just my version. If someone maybe believes I had I said something wrong, please you know let me know. But this is kind of like what I remember that living. Maybe I don't get all the details right, but I, that's 
what I know gather on interviewing people. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Us. Let me introduce you to today's guest, Pedro Sauer. Pedro is an eighth degree core belt under Hicks and Gracie. He is the founder of the Pedro Sauer Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Association, which has become one of the largest and most respected associations in the world. Currently, they have 150 affiliates across the globe, 9,000 registered students, and over 200 black belts under him. Mestre Pedro Sauer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Appreciate that. My pleasure. Yeah, it's an honor to have you here. And you, you're one of the first Brazilians who came in the, the 80s. And I, 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 I believe it's the beginning, maybe the early 90s. But, you know, the, the first group that started coming to the U.S. to develop jiu-jitsu here. So I'm, I'd love to hear more about the beginning, the early days. But before we get to that, let's talk about how martial arts got into your life. And then eventually, how jujitsu show up in your life? Okay, uh, no, I don't. I don't well, see me, that. There you go. There we go. Well, I, you know, I came to America in uh, in May of 1990. Okay. Uh, that was the date that I came to America. I came right after Hickson. Uh, Hickson came in in begin in late of 88, begin of 89. That's when Hickson established in Los Angeles, and yeah. Uh, uh, I was pretty much, uh, Hicks was a good friend. We used to grow up together. Uh, we, we grew up in, in Flamengo since we were little young kids. I remember Hicks, the first time he was still a, a green belt. The first time was, we, mm. we saw him on the mat and I, I couldn't believe uh, what Hicks was doing. I was so in shock the first time that I saw the training. And I was like, no, I'm never gonna do this. This, this is not for me. This is kind of crazy. You guys gonna break your neck. I, that was my kind of you know, dream, kind of nightmare kind of thought. And uh, anyway, it took me a few years to, to get back to the academy, to get back to the academy in, in Rio Branco with Elio Gracie. And uh, when I arrived there, Elio was, uh, he was pretty much the head instructor. He was hands-on every single night, uh, kicked my butt so many times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he twisted me pretty good. I was a, I was a pretty wild kid uh, growing up in Brazil, you know, in Flamengo. Um, didn't have a, a, the best friendships on the streets that you can say. So Ellie was the one who kind of put me in a good spot. But um, anyway, I came to America in, in May of 1990, right after Hickson. And uh, I came here with Elio. Uh, basically, we, we arrived almost the same, uh, same week. And uh, I went to, I stayed at Hickson's house. And me, Elio, and Limon, we used to share the garage. Mm. We used to sleep in the garage for about six months there in Los Angeles. It was a very tough beginning. I can I can't imagine. Now, when uh, so in what moment did you go to Utah? I moved to Utah in December of 1990 because those six months that I spent in California, I I learned how to speak Spanish, but I didn't learn no English at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought about man, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be somebody here in this country, I gotta learn the language. And by now, I'm just surrounded by Brazilians, and it was a tough environment too. In the beginning, it was a, a bunch of Brazilians. And, and, and it was a tons of black belts, uh, good brown belts. Limon was a purple belt at the time, but Paulo Barroso was a brown belt. Hanzo, it was, he just arrived here. The Machado brothers and Hoyler, they arrived here too. So, so that, that's from the beginning. It was many guys black belts, but we didn't have no students. There was nobody for us to teach. We used to have only a few private class here and there. Hicks used to get busy with private class. It was very affordable the pride class it was like 20 bucks for half an hour or something like that it was super affordable it was a, we all kind of had a very hard life in the beginning it was very difficult not easy at all yeah now how was the beginning back to, in california we got the famous crazy challenges and uh, all the trainer garage the all the the challenges they have going to other schools or inviting people to come over so is that something that in Brazil you already got involved with that, that kind of training too, or you picked up more in the U.S.? Of course, the trainer was part of the self-defense and everything, but as far as like the challenges start to get busier with that for you was when you got in the U.S.? Yes, got really busy because what happened here in America, uh, that's what I discovered when I came to America. Uh, I, I was training Jiu-Jitsu in Brazil since the 70s. And uh, over there in Brazil, 
uh, everybody who trained jiu-jitsu somehow had a, a little, he had a little understanding, knew how to dance a little bit. Even though the guy was a brand new guy, maybe he never seen, but he maybe he had an uncle who trained jiu-jitsu, he had a, a brother who trained jiu-jitsu before. Uh, it was not like a fresh, complete fresh. And uh, when we moved to America, we discovered they're fresh guys. And, and those guys were super dangerous because they knew some wrestling, they knew a lot of karate, a lot of kung fu, but zero idea about the grappling. They knew a little bit of wrestling, but you know, drag, wrestling was a very kind of physically uh, more demanding, uh, was not so much strategy on surviving. It was go, 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 because you know, you do wrestling when you're young kids. So you just press play and you just go full steam. One thing that I can tell that helped us tremendously on the beginning was the self-defense part of jiu-jitsu that Elio Grace make us do back in, in, in downtown Rio de Janeiro, downtown academy, we used to train for the most unpredictable situations. Uh, every single day we have to do the self-defense, the whole entire curriculum, Elio Grace curriculum, all the program on the textbook. So we did the, the, the self-defense life, like a life. People try to club you or, or chain or knife. It was, it was a pretty much life video deal in full speed too. And that moment, I, I can tell without a doubt, Gustavo, that's the time that I appreciate the most the self-defense was when I started dealing with those guys that was completely unpredictable. That means they, you put somebody in your guard and the guy doesn't thought about pass your guard. The guy just got up and decided to do a somersault or decide to jump or decide to flip backward. Complete crazy. Mm -hmm. But you know, some people did that. And, and if, you don't, if you're not aware of self-defense, Man, we got hurt pretty big, like a, really bad. A lot of people got hurt in the beginning because you're dealing with somebody that speaks different language, not just a verbal language, but body language. And, and they don't have to accommodate, they didn't know how to accommodate jujitsu. They just decided to do an anti jujitsu. And that was a super challenge for us in the beginning, especially if you're a small person. You know, if you're giving up size, that Ali was like, you know, hey, if somebody's twice your size, you know, you don't embarrass me. You got to make him say uncle. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it was. The old man was over there. Look, you know, he was right there breathing your brain over here. And it, with Grandmaster Ellie, it was no joke. It was no mess around. It was no joke. It had to represent the art. So that's how we arrived here in America. It was uh, basically how you put a, a, a free, uh, it was a magazine that kind of come up with some kind of challenge. And how do you offer, uh, offer uh, like $100,000 whoever could beat a, a jiu-jitsu black belt. And uh, man, at that moment on, for about a couple of years, we had an open challenge match almost every day. Wow. Yeah, it was a pretty tough deal. I remember driving my car to the academy and I looked to my seat and I, I, like I forgot the boxing gloves. So I have to turn around to do a U-turn and go back, pick up boxing gloves because I never knew who was gonna show up in class with a friend who was gonna challenge. Now, do you remember your first match in the school? And how, how did you feel mentally going in, you know, going for that first challenge? Well, I got to say, uh, I did a lot of challenge in Brazil. Uh, a, a lot of, uh, in Brazil, I was prepared uh, at a downtown Rio de Janeiro, a downtown academy. Elio prepared us for challenge right there. Elio used to bribe people on the streets to come to the academy and to try to fight us. And uh, what Elio used to do, uh, I remember construction uh, business right in the Rua do Ovidor, um, where the Grace Academy, you know, the end of the Grace Academy kind of face, it was 18 storage high, 18th 18 floor. It was a building that's going build, was getting built. And six, eight months later, the building was the same height, 18th floor. So all the workers start looking inside and Elio's like, hey, come on in. How much you guys make today? Oh, I make 10 bucks. I'll give you guys 20 bucks. But you got to hold those guys over here. You got to put those guys in the headlock. Don't cannot let those guys skate. Gustavo, at the moment on, I can tell you without a doubt, Grandmaster Ellie was testing us for the unpredictable moves. And I'm, I was so glad <laughs> to, to, be, to be in that situation, to be put in that situation. Mm -hmm. And what was some of the... Uh some of the matches that really stood out for you when you look back and for any way you, you want, it could be maybe because it was very difficult or for whatever reason, uh, it caught your attention and you remember well. 
Well, the toughest match that I had when I, when, I, when, I, when I moved to America was with a wrestler. His name was Mark Schultz. You know, and uh, before, before me and Mark, Mark Schultz uh, have a, a wrestling match, um, Mark trained with Hickson. Uh, Hickson came to visit me in Utah. And when he arrived in Utah, the guy who was putting the seminar together put an open challenge for anybody in town to come to challenge Hickson and myself. And we had a several people that came, that shows up with the magazines, offering them their money. And they say, listen, the money is there, but you got to put 10,000. If you want to, if you want to make a hundred thousand, you got to put 10, but because you're already here, go ahead and put a box in gloves and we do for free, no money involved. And that's how, that's how was the catch. It was this. So Mark Schultz was one of the toughest matches that I had here, to be honest. He was an unbelievable talent guy. Uh, he knew wrestling and he was such a vicious guy and he learned jujitsu pretty good too, because you get an Olympic gold medal in wrestling, you show mm -hmm. him a half dozen of moves. He's a nightmare. So Mark was a guy who's a, a white belt in jiu-jitsu, but he, used to tap, he could have tapped a black belt. Incredible. And what are, around what year did things start to calm down as far as like the challenges? When did it start to calm down? The countdown started, I want to say, after Hoist fought with UFC, UFC 1, 2, 3, what happened, we had a many challenges coming to the academy. So 93, 94, I believe the challenge, the, the tough matches start slowing down in 97, 98, 99, a little bit later, that's when people start to be more educated. And uh, Horio put a lot of uh, videos on Blockbuster. And uh, what happened that I used to go to the Blockbuster, all the Blockbuster in town, and put my business cards uh, on every Blockbuster nice. uh, videos. <laughs> magazines, I used to put magazines. But on the, be on the beginning, it was horrible advertisement. It's like, you know, if you want to get your face smashed, if you want to get your arm broke, <laughs> If you want to go, get, go put it to sleep, contact this address here. <laughs> that was not a good idea. <laughs> now, how was the process for you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, to start taking the school? And then, again, well, things started to calm down. And then now, treating more like, okay, now this is over. How was for you this transition? I don't know. I think... You work uh, as a stockbroker, maybe in, in Brazil. Yeah. So now we're doing something that you're basically running your business. Did you have anyone helping you with that? How was the, the process? Yeah. On well, the beginning, it was very difficult because I didn't spoke any English. When I moved to America, I, I moved to America with zero, zero English. So I couldn't speak a word in English. I knew where is the bathroom? I'm hungry <laughs> and do like this. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only words that I knew. So in the beginning, I have a lot of help. I had a, a, a bookkeeper that helped me out in the beginning. Uh, I had my wife that helped me out. I have a tons of people that helped me out. And uh, what happened that with my, with my mentality of a stock broker, I, I was able, I, I worked as a broker for 12 years and I work in a very good bank in Brazil. Very, very, one of the best banks there was, uh, it used to be the old Atlantica Boa Vista, Bradesco. Mm -hmm. And I work with all the, the president and vice president of the Bradesco. Those are the guys who kind of got me in. Antonio Carlos Almeida Braga, you know, the guy who helped Ayrton Senna Braguinha, who passed away beginning of this year. And uh, he was a, it was a good part of, the, of my first job in um, uh, working in a stock market. And what happened that I noticed, a lot of people that work in stock markets, they got filthy millionaire very quickly. I watched people making money left and right. But there was something that I could not do it. It was the principal of honesty. Mm. I could not take advantage of people or, or, you know, snuggle myself and kind of be sneaky. Everything that I did, I did by the book because I had like, you know, uh, I came from a family that uh, my mom was very in disciplinary. My dad was very disciplinary, very proper. And he said, you know, you do things honestly by the book. I left for you a clean name. You better leave a clean name for your kids and your grandkids. Don't you ever disappoint them. So that stuff stuck with me forever. I couldn't do it. So I worked 12 years as a broker and I learned as a broker that uh, if you decide to, to, to make a lot of money, yeah, you're gonna be rich very quickly, but you, you wanna, you're, gonna, you're gonna be sneaky. You have to be sneaky. You have to, you have to take advantage of others. Or you could make a, a, a fair transactions. You could be very fair all the time. And instead you just score one time 
you score hundreds of times, but little, little tiny scores. So you make tiny little money, uh, pulverize, instead just gouge the money and just be rich right away. And after that, you have this bad reputation. So I transferred that to Jiu Jitsu. And, uh, and I formed in 1992, I formed the first Jiu Jitsu Association. I, I started teaching a guy from uh, Virginia Beach. His name was Frank Cucci, one of my first students from, from, he was a Navy SEAL from Virginia Beach. And he fell in love with Jiu Jitsu. He was a very uh, dedicated martial arts. And after that, uh, he wants to, to be affiliated. And it's like, I don't even know how to do that. How do I mean affiliate? Well, you can open some kind of franchise. It's like, ah, I don't know if I can open a franchise because I'm the first known Gracie to open a Grace Academy in Utah. And I didn't know how was the franchise. So what happened is I say, listen, you don't need to have a franchise, but what I do, I'll teach you. I'll go to your place uh, once a month for five days. So every month for five days, I started going to Virginia Beach. And over there, I met a whole bunch of Navy SEALs. I met uh, Jeff Curran, that was another MMA fighter, great particular. I met Greg Nelson, that was another unbelievable martial arts. And I met tons of people there at Frank Kutz School. And that's the beginning of the association. And after a few years, I had already, when I had a 34 academies affiliate under me, Hickson, he decided to open his first American Jiu-Jitsu Association, Hickson Gracie. And I, I went to everybody and I told guys, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to tell what I'm going to do. Pedro Sauer Association, from now, on, from now on, it is finito, it's not happening anymore. And I'm going to affiliate myself with Hickson and I advise you guys to do the same thing. Come with me, lest I'll be under Hickson. And that's what we did. We finished the association in 1994. So from 1994 until 2001, it was no Pedro Sauer Association. Uh, we start again uh, after 2001 because Hoxon passed away in 2000. And uh, yeah, it was so difficult. And Hickson was, was such a difficult time for Hickson, difficult time for, for Kim. Uh, it, it was a very difficult time. So what happened is I, a lot of people were requesting, Professor, I want to train, you know, but I cannot find Hickson. I cannot find, you know, what are you going to do? I say, you know what, don't worry. I'll keep, I'll, I'll do seminars. I keep, I keep make sure they'll keep teaching you guys. And uh, you, with time, Hickson pretty much uh, let go of his association. And I start up again, the Pedro Sal Association. And as, after 2001, we start all the schools. And the secret for this, Gustavo, is to make sure that everybody's happy. That's the whole secret. Yeah, which is not <laughs> an easy thing. <laughs> it is tricky. And, and a lot of time it revolves around money, revolves uh, uh, with a status, you know, which, or who you are. So I try to bring everybody up. I try to put everybody in the level. Uh, you know, I'm a, just a normal guy. Uh, I'm a complete normal guy. I have a 100% normal life, uh, father of seven. You know, I have wow. four to grand kids on the way. So I'm a complete normal guy. And I try to bring everybody with me. And that's something that... Uh, a lot of people that we get as a black belt, as a instructor, we put ourselves a little bit above, uh, above people. And that's a bad example to set up because when we start producing black belts and they, they feel the same way too, they, they feel that to the guy over there, if they see that you are you're a black belt, you are, you know, fifth degree, six degree, coral belt, whatever, you're climb, climbing up, but you're still very kind of mild, very kind of honest, very kind of uh, friendly with everybody, they follow the same example. And that's, the, that's what I did. That's awesome. Now, uh, just trying to learn more about how your process of becoming an entrepreneur, becoming a, a business person. So when, you came, so when you came back and then started to reorganize the association, what do you think that looking now, of course, you did the best you could with all the knowledge and awareness that you had at that moment, but looking back, what would be something that you, you would have done differently as far as running the business? Things that, you know, people maybe take consideration, maybe some business owners who have not just if they teach you just or not, but they have other businesses and they have to be responsible for multiple uh, schools. And so looking back, what do you think you would have done different, if anything? Well, I got to tell you, uh, the secret that I noticed that happened in our association was a curriculum. 
Got it. I can tell without a doubt that us as a Brazilian, we learned Jiu Jitsu in Brazil with uh, the curriculum was completely, it was kind of mixed. It was sometimes was not even curriculum. We just come to class and we spar, we grapple, we have fun. But uh, the lack of curriculum, what happens is that you build holes. You got uh, many holes in your game and you pay the price later down the road. Uh, the curriculum allows you to cover all those holes and give the opportunity to every single person to progress to the rank in a very fair, in a very effective way, and does not require the guy to be a species, like, you know, a wrestler, a, 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 you know, Olympic wrestler or somebody who's kind of incredible talent guy. Oh, this guy's going to be a black belt. I, I decide to do it different. I decide to do, I put the responsibility on the black belt, but not for himself, but I want to see what the black belt can do for others. That was the difference. And the moment I put this, Gustavo, I can tell without a doubt the association exploded because um, when you don't think about yourself and you think about the other ones, what happens that you, you start sharing moves, you start following curriculum by the book because you want to make sure that everybody follows footsteps. So I think that's one of the and mistakes that I did in the past. Uh, uh, you know, you always trust people. Sometimes you always do things, uh, you know, you, you believe in people. You, you, and, and of course, you always have somebody that here and there that kind of, you know, let you down mm -hmm. or some people who kind of decide to do his own way. And of course, that hurt us because martial arts is a, is a very trust, is a, is a very uh, powerful exchanging of uh, trust between each other. And we want to build a longevity. And uh, I believe that uh, longevity is the most important part for us in, in martial arts because um, it's easy to get a new student, but it's hard to keep the guy motivating class. Yeah. When you switch that and you keep the guys motivating class and you don't pay attention too much about the new guys who come in, especially when they come in with different academies, um, believe it or not, um, the association today with 150 schools I believe I have maybe two or three schools that uh, the black belts, they are not made by me from 150. It's incredible. And now, what about struggles? Of course, you've been through ups and downs like any other business owner. What are some of the struggles, one of the toughest ones that you went through, and what did you learn from this experience? Well, we do a lot of struggle. Struggling is something that uh, we try so much things, so many try and errors. We think that, you know, in the early days, you can put an advertisement and people's going to come to your door. Yeah. And it's not that way. That's not the way it works. Uh, martial arts uh, is super important for you to have a good lineage because the students will follow the same footsteps that we do. You know, the, the, we, every day we open our doors, we have a student that starts a brand new white belt Pretty soon they climb up, they climb up, they climb up. Pretty soon they're good blue, purple, brown belt. Pretty soon they're giving us hard time or giving all the top-notch guys hard time. And the guy look at you and say, oh, you know, Gustavo, uh, I think I'm going to open my own school. I'm going to do my own thing. And I'm going to do things by myself. And uh, by the way, this guy over there offered me a black belt. And the guy goes there and take it. This happened with me uh, when I moved to America. I, I used to have a student. Of course, and I never mentioned names, but uh, I had a student that was my highest rank brown belt, second degree. And he went to Brazil for a, a seminar and came back wearing a black belt. And uh, when he came back as a black belt, you know, of course, all, everybody in the school kind of, hey, come on, man. What, how, 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 how do you accept a black belt from a guy that, uh, you know, you just barely met? You spent eight and a half years in this location mm -hmm. here learning jiu-jitsu. In, in one weekend, you get a black belt and you put it on. And uh, that's, that's kind of a, a things that happen. And, and it's very tricky because uh, you cannot do nothing. If, if you accept the belt, hey, this is your new instructor. But the problem is when you open your own school, your own association, you have, you're going to have tons of people follow your footsteps. <laughs> yeah. You're going to do just like it. That is true. Now... <laughs> I know you've been training with training with Hickson for so many years and having been exposed to so many incredible black belts, what do you feel that 
is different about Hicks and that you had opportunity to to live and experience not only you hands on, but like you watching what he is doing to the people. What do you feel that it makes the the biggest difference in on his jujitsu? Yeah, Hicks's personality. You know, he's a he's a super nice guy. A lot of you know some people. If you look fascia, you look at the the face. It looks like, like you know the demeanor. Sometimes Hicks will look like can be a little bit intimidated kind of guy or tough or kind of, but he is the nicest guy you will ever come across. He has a heart that does not fit on his cage, man. He's, he's just a huge heart. He does not give up. You cannot make the guy give up, man. It's impossible to make him give up. And he's a super bright guy, a very bright, brilliant mind, very smart. Uh, you know, he's a, got incredible amount of experience to travel all over the world got the chance to meet people everywhere. And as a, as a kid, I was impressed with kid, right? Uh, with Hicks was a kid, right in the beginning when I met him, I couldn't believe it. A guy of my age, because we're the same age. And uh, I remember watching Hicks and getting in a fight one time on the streets. And I was like, my gosh, yeah. Hicks was like 15 years old. He just fought with this mariner. And this mariner was shredded like a big fit guy. Hicks would just demolish him. And, and for us as a kid, it was like, what in the hell you got? What is this, man? How, oh, this is called the jiu-jitsu. We, I have no idea what that's about. No idea. And that's how Hickson was. He's just a, a tremendously nice guy, uh, incredible talent. Uh, he's a super giving person. He, he'll take the, the, the shirt off his, his body to give to you. He's, he share food with you. He, He's a great guy. I cannot even tell how nice the guy is. If, if people really came to find out how nice he is, it is just a, a unbelievable. But on the mat, mm -hmm. it's like a train with a, with a, a, with a bear, uh, and with a skillful bear. It, it is, you cannot do nothing, Gustavo. It is an it is a, a unbelievable, humbling experience. And I watched Hickson demoralize so many black belts before. Oh, my goodness. I remember when uh, um, 1990, if I'm not mistaken, it's going to be July of 1990. I, had, I was in America for a couple of months. And uh, Fabinho uh, Gurgel mm -hmm. came from, from Brazil. And Fabio was tough as could be. Fabinho, was, when he was young, because Fabinho was a big kid as a young, he was kind of stocky. Uh, he was a uh, Jacare student. Mm -hmm. And Fabi was very talented, beautiful jiu-jitsu, tough guy too. He used to come to the Corpo Quattro uh, to train once in a while and uh, grappling. And, and I, I always liked Fabi. He's a great guy. Great, great guy too. Super nice. Love the dude. And when he arrived in America, he told me, oh, Pedrinho, you know, I have not tapped for almost five years. I have not tapped. I said, Fabio, you get ready, my friend, because tonight mm -hmm. he's going to be a different story. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, oh, you wait, man. you wait. Hickson, man, it's different. I just want to warn you, you know, Hickson is, is, is very, very smooth, man. So I watched Fabio and Hickson train, and my goodness, you know, it was like nothing, walked like nothing. Yeah, I had a, uh, I interviewed Fabio last week, matter of fact, and then he mentioned about that experience too, that, that was incredible. Definitely he was, Hickson was just really ahead of time and, and with everyone and he's saying too like seminars that have seen he gone with multiple black belts back to back and be able to handle it and i think was i was i did an interview with marcelo alonso for people who don't know uh the photographer uh in brazil and then he was he was mentioning that he was covering one of the event that hickson wasn't wasn't back in brazil for quite some time so they had a, like a big event and i think one day he came to school and like enroll with like over 20 black belts said that he did really train with everyone saying like man no one told me like I saw you know that and what he was doing with high level guys that people did not expect that unbelievable I he told me about the train he went to Gracie Barra uh, apparently and Carlinos asked him yeah. to train with all the top guys that was winning tournaments back back to back Clean up the house. Hickson goes there and just step everyone, mounting everybody. Nobody could escape from Hickson's mouth. 
and later he switch, he escape from everyone and tap everyone. It is, it is out of this world. Then Hickson, I, I tell him that when he born, he born doing the elbow escape through his mouth <laughs> wounds. <laughs> it's incredible. What, what about with Elio Gracie? What is the uh, the main lessons that you got from him? Not like jujitsu lessons, but life lessons that you carry to this day. Oh man, many, many lessons. I gotta, gotta tell that Elio was the guy who kind of shaped my personality from the beginning. I told that I was a little bit more wild when I was a kid. I grew up in a, in a kind of rough environment. Uh, basically, I, I grew up in the streets and Flamengo was not an easy, uh, it was not an easy place for you to grow up. We used to have like a, a lot of uh, people that, uh, crazy fighters, uh, since the time you, you heard about Madame Satan, mm -hmm. yes. See, so Madame Satan used to live on the same street that my school in Catechi, really? Jose Severo Martins. And uh, I watched the guy when I was, as a little kid uh, punching a huge piece of meat and, and completely grinded the meat. Um, and and you, when you grow up in an environment like this, it's pretty rough. And Elio Grace has his first school in Flamengo uh, at. Uh, who are Marquês Jabranche. That's his first academy. So we had a lot of people from Flamengo. Used to have another guy, his name was Massisti, was another crazy tough guy. Uh, Marco Ruas, Marco Ruas, me and Marco Ruas, we test for, for yellow belt in Madureira oh, cool. when we were just little kids. Uh, we used to do Taekwondo together. I used to train Taekwondo at the Praça José de Alencar in academy of uh, Yo Jai Li. But um, Elio, he basically shaped up all of us, anybody who has a chance to, to be around Elio, you grow up to be a better person. You, you got a good lessons. With Elio, you could not say maybe. You have to say yes or no. He never accepted maybe. He didn't accept excuse, like, you know, no excuses. You know, he was pretty, uh, pretty determined individual. My mom was trying to buy a piece of property uh, many, many years ago. And uh, Elio was say, Pedrinho, come here. I'm going to sell a piece of property for, for your mom, for your family, the same way I'm going to be selling for one of my kids. So we, we go to Elio's house at 7 o'clock in the morning at the, at the valley in, in Taipava. When you arrived there at 7 in the morning, Elio was already working, digging a lake himself. He was digging mm -hmm. with, a, with a yellow cover, and it was raining, and he was digging in the rain. 7 o'clock in the morning, and he got up, took his yellow uh, uh, rain jacket off, got in the car with us, we went there to see the property. Um, he was a very good friend of my mom. Elio and my mom, they used to be friends for, actually they died in the same day oh, of wow. the same year. Wow. Yeah, six hours apart. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, November 20, uh, January 29 of 2009. They both died in the same day. And anyway, lessons with, with Grandmaster Elio Gustav was incredible. Uh, he made me be a man. He made me be an honest man. He made me be a, a, a honorable man. There was no way I could look at Elio Grace and say, tell any kind of smart ass advantage that I did. Mm -hmm. He never put up with nothing like that. It has to be by the book. So he made us. And what about one of the best out of piece of advice you've ever received? maybe from him, or if not from him, anyone that comes to your mind that really stood out and it's uh, advice that you carry for your whole life? Well, honor. Elio used to have a very strong honor. honor. You have to be an honorable person. And that's something that I learned from Elio. If men without an honor cannot, it's, it, no, we, we are very fragile without honor. So honor was something that he, he made me believe, he made me dick he made me cherish uh integrity you know he made me be very by the book every time that I, I you know imagine i was a little kid i was probably 15 years old so from 15 until 32 i i saw elio every day wow you know and he he i gotta tell honestly he, he twist my arm twist my neck kick my butt so many times oh so when I was a kid growing up, I was a complete ADD. I'd been expelled from 12 different like, schools. I could not stop still, man. I was totally hyper. 
And my mom told Elio, oh, Pedro is this, Pedro is that, Pedro cannot do this, Pedro cannot do that. Oh, my God, Elio, I don't know what to do with Pedro. And Elio was like, man, Pedro doesn't look that crazy for me. If I give him a $100 bill, do you think you eat it or you put it in his pocket? And my mom said, oh, Elio, you put it in his pocket. I can still fix him. If you, put in his, if you eat it, I cannot fix him. But if you put it in his pocket, leave him with me. And at one time, we were grappling in downtown at the Grace Academy downtown, 18 stories high. And uh, he got in the mount position. I, uh, uh, he passed my guard, crossed by the mount. And uh, when he was in the mount position, I was trying to get out. So I, I tried to get out here, push here, push there, tried to elbow escape, tried to elbow escape again, both sides elbow escape. And uh, he, I could not budge him. He was there, stuck in the mount position, could not budge him. And he looked at me and said, oh, you think you're crazy? And later I looked to his eyes like this, like, what? I, it took me completely out of my, out of my because I was in an autopilot to try to escape. Pretty soon he told, oh, you think you're crazy? You can trick your mom and your parents with son of a gun, but you don't trick me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling after that day, I was scared. I was afraid because I used to trick people. That's what I used to do. I used to pretend I was crazy. Yeah. So I walk in schools and I see the biggest guy and I go there to the guy and punch him right in the nose because that's what my older brother told me. Hey, if you get in the school, you punch the toughest one. Everybody else is going to respect you. Okay. And you go there and do stupid things like this. Until I met Grandmaster Elio. And after that, I was so in shock. Because I, I was not, first of all, I was learning jiu-jitsu. And I got so terrified on, on my beginning of jiu-jitsu because I got spanked by Hoyle. Hoyle was a little kid. Hoyle was a little boy, man. I got spanked by Hoyle. Little kids uh, kicked my butt left and right. And I was a brand new kid training. So I was scared of people, you know, after being a crazy guy, tough guy, being in 12 different schools. Pretty soon, like, oh, my goodness. How many people know jiu-jitsu? I, I, never, I never thought about that. Thank you, God, I never I, I encountered a jiu-jitsu guy. <laughs> but I did encounter a jiu-jitsu guy in my school in Ateneo, San Luis. I encountered Crawling. Mm. Me and Crawling, Crawling Gracie. We went to the same school, same classroom. And I t told him, uh, first day of class, I walk in my classroom. I was ready to know uh, uh, how called, uh, I couldn't pass the year. I have to kind of do the same year back again. Yeah. Hippie yeah, 2 one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The failed, whatever grade. I, I, I did the same too. I failed uh, seventh grade. Yeah. So I had to do it again too. <laughs> yep. So I, I did fail many times, many times, four times to be, to be honest, because I was so hyper and I could not stop still. I could not stop still. So when I saw crawling in my classroom, he was sitting on my desk and I used to have my name engraved on the desk. <laughs> And I say, hey, you, get the hell out of here. That's my, my, that's my seat. And Crowley looked at me, pick up his stuff, move to the seat, quiet, and then say a word. And later the teacher, hey, you know, so, 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 crawling Gracie. And I look around, I say, like, holy cow, must be some Gracie guy. So I went, I went there to ask him if he was Hickson's brother. He's like, no, no, I'm his cousin. Well, next day, I was in a fight with Crowley, right next day. And crawling just flipped me, put, put me in the stomach and just hold me there and just smile. I couldn't do nothing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's how I got introduced pretty much to, to, to the jiu-jitsu environment. <laughs> now, talking about all your experience training with uh, Master Elio, and what are some of the main, main concepts that you share with brand new people? Some of the conversations you have, someone starting and you want to just kind of Given uh, you know, share some of uh, your wisdom with them. So what are some of the things that you'd like to share from the brand new people? Because we do have people who listen to podcasts. They're brand new. There are a lot of white belts. People just started. A lot of people have been training a long time. But what are some of the things that you, you like to share with them right, right at the beginning? Well, the number one is don't get hurt. Don't grapple too early. Don't go to for, for the full grappling because what happens that we have a muscle memory and uh, when, when, when you start grappling and your muscle memory is not educated, you do awkward things. And those awkward things can result in injuries, uh, not just for yourself, but for somebody else too. So my advice for a new guy is to avoid sparring 
until you understand and you have a, a good foundation, at least a safe foundation. You know, the, the, the correct way to, to have a good posture, the correct way to tap early, you know, be careful with your joint, don't, don't let your, your joint hyperextend, don't resist too much neck pressure, because a neck, you know, somebody's brand new guy, the neck's not, you know, it's not well developed, and you try to hold on, pretty soon you, you cannot swallow anymore, and you have a hard time to pump. So I had, my advice for everybody is like this. Learning jiu-jitsu is just like to learn how to drive a high-performance car. You want to drive a high-performance car? You have to, first of all, you have to start with a skinny tires and low horsepower. The skinny tires and low house horsepower is going to allow you to start feel how the car will, will, will kind of perform on the, on the track. So you learn how, how to, because you, you drive very slow and the car is already drifting, drifting very slow. So it's a, a lot more friendly. The drift is a lot more mild. And after that, you put bigger tires, bigger tires, bigger tires, until you get a Formula One. And now you have a, like an incredible amount of horsepower. You have incredible amounts of, amounts of torque and you have incredible amount of grip. Well, that moment on, you can start racing a Formula One. Doesn't mean that you know how to drive yet, but you know that what Formula One is capable to do. In Jiu Jitsu, we give the key of Formula One to a brand new student. And we tell him, hey, if you, anything that you feel bad, just hit the brake, just tap. So the tap is the brake. My advice for everybody in the beginning, do not spar until you understand curriculum, until you understand mechanics, until you've done the program, until you're accustomed how to do the UPA 100 times, how to pass the guard 100 times, how to do the arm lock 100 times, how to do triangles 100 times, how to do choke 100 times. After you understand all those, you start to understand your limitations. Hey, now go ahead and start training, but go slow, even though you, you're going to turn your muscle memory. And you're going to go fast. You're going to, you're going to hold fast. You're going to use a lot of muscle. But it's still, hey, calm down. You have to always remind the guy, calm down, relax, calm down, relax. For a new guy, those are the most important words you can say. For sure. Now, let me ask you this. Do you like reading? Do you have the habit of reading? What, how, uh, what kind of content do you like to consume? I don't know if it's maybe with podcasts, with TV, documentaries. Uh, so what do you like? I like documentaries. Uh, I like to study mechanics. I'm a, I'm a very, um, uh, I came from a family of engineers. Uh, my, my family in Brazil, on the earliest days, like my grandfather had a, a factory, a gear factory machine. It used to be in São Cristóvão in Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. And he had 35,000 designs of gear trademark. Wow. Yeah, it was the biggest South American factory for gear, machinery. And everybody in my family was, was machiners. Uh, uh, they, they understood about uh, gears and machine. And today I see jiu-jitsu, I see just like the gears. They were how they, it's just uh, how to use leverage. That's what it is. You, 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 you separate two gears, put two gears together. One is small, the other one is big. You apply uh, torque one side, you got a power on the other side. And I see jiu-jitsu the same way, same, same way. It is just the same mechanic. I like a lot of documentaries. I like to, you know, I read books uh, of, uh, I, I like to read mechanic books. That's my hobby. I do a lot of mechanics. Uh, I like to work in Porsches and uh, Chevrolets and, and Volkswagens. I, by the way, I just restored Grandmaster Helios' car in Brazil. Oh, wow. Yeah, his Passat Iraqi, o Iraquiano. <laughs> I just restore brand new car, and uh, yeah, I, I like to read. I like to watch the commentaries. I like to see. I like to watch jujitsu moves. I watch jujitsu every day. Hmm. My wife, she said, "You are sick. I can't <laughs> believe it. you've been doing this. This next year is going to be fifty years that I've been putting my gear." Wow. And I, uh, oops, I'm still kind of uh, reading and and watching. I'm still very. Uh, I love every, all the new generations, guys. You know, I love to see Andre Galvão. I like to see every, uh, Caio Terra, uh, Mendes Brothers, uh, you name it, I, uh, Roger Gracie, anybody. 
you know, the, 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 bro, the Hero and Hanner, uh, Crone. I like to see all the young guys. And I'm, when I'm on the mat, Gustavo, I have a white belt on my, I have a white belt tendency. I can see moves from a white belt perspective from, from the beginning. And I can escalate up to core belt, whatever level you can bring it up. But I can escalate. But I like to see from, from the basic foundation level and how I see this move grow. And I like to see the strategies. And I, I always thought about as a defense, you have to understand the self-defense. When you understand the self-defense, that's give us the predict, pr practitioners when we grapple. And I want to try to make you say, uncle, when I notice mm -hmm. that you miss the point of self-defense, I'm going to put money in the move. If I notice that you're using a good self-defense to stop the move, I'm going to go for something else. Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a lo longer time waiting for you to counterattack me. Because that's how jiu-jitsu goes. If you're stubborn, you just go into Las Vegas and you're playing poker with your cards like this, facing the guys. Mm. Because you're too stubborn. You know, you stay there too long. So we need to, number one, respect each other. I need to respect your mechanics. I need to respect your moves. The moment you bring good mechanics, I have to respect that. If you bring good mechanics and I don't respect, that's when I pay the price. And it's, it's really cool. I, I started training when you basically when you move to the US, I started training in 1989. So I got kind of like the beginning of um, kind of like the more technical revolution with the competition start to happen more. So you were, uh, you know, before that in the, in the 80s and being able to see in the 70s, being able to see the tournament. So for, for you, it's got to be so surreal to remember like, wow, look how that used to be and now how how it is right now and especially technically the the evolution you know so how do you see that in a looking back into it was fairly everything simple but competition creates that you know people just thinking about different options different what can we do so how was uh, how was for you to to remember the early days and see now like how crazy especially technically you know the moves are, are getting Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in the early days, it was a lot of tough guys. We used to have a lot of tough guys. And uh, the history of Jiu-Jitsu back in Brazil, Grandmaster Helio, his academy was in downtown Rio de Janeiro. So basically his students was not that it was everybody was workers. You know, everybody wear a tie. And uh, we, we, we was not people getting the gym, very fit, very strong. And Halls, Halls move. He started uh, his academy above Carson. So Carson used to be in a, a, a Figueiredo Magalhães, second floor, and Halls moved to the third floor. And what happened over there is that they got all the young generation from the Copacabana Beach, from the Arpoador, the tough guys, you know, they, they, a lot more fit people. They arrived to the school. Those guys that start arriving to the schools. And uh, in downtown, we did not have the tough guys. We had the technical guys because Eli was very into the technique. But um, of course, when the, the toughness arrived in Jiu-Jitsu, it was hard for us. It was very trick, especially in tournaments that you only have you know, four or five minutes to go for. Man, in five minutes, you're dead. You know, we, we pretty much were good for one match. You know? and, and the guys from, uh, from Copacabana, the guys from all the schools, they are more fit, they are more younger, jovial. He used to surf, no, he used to skateboard, they used to jog in the sand, they used to lift weights, bar, you know, go to the, do the bars on the beach. So it was a different crowd. I believe that uh, I, honestly, I advise everybody to compete. I compete in every belt. Since brand new white belt, Hickson put me to compete. Uh, I, I compete uh, as a white belt with three, four months of, of training. Hickson told me, no, let's go there, Pedrinho, no problem, friend. Any problem, just put a guy in your guard. You're going to do fine. I said, okay, sign me up. <laughs> so I go there to Hickson Gracie. I keep Hickson Gracie. And uh, it was a host academy. And I fought against uh, Arthur Pardal. That was a super tough guy from Halls. And he beat the crap of me. He passed my guard 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't tap me. 
Yeah. And on the end of the competition, you know, the, the bell rang, and how, uh, Arthur was in the mount position, you know, both hands on my neck, and I just <sighs> survived. And when Arthur got up, I saw Hickson's face come right to my face, smiling. Man, you did awesome. I was like, Hickson, man, this guy kicked my... No, no, you fought on the toughest guys from, from, from Halls, and you did good. I was like, you son of a gun. I can't <laughs> believe it. You told me it was easy, man. <laughs> <laughs> you did awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, now we're getting close to the end of the interview. Now I want to know what is going on. What's excited? What's exciting going on with your association? I know that right now it's kind of tricky with the COVID as far as events or some states are still closed. And But what do you got going on with the association? What's exciting? Well, we just had a, a since December of uh, last year, we, I, uh, I form a, a board of directors. We nice. have uh, now six directors that are running the association. A uh, long time ago, uh, until prior to that, was just one man, one guy uh, running the show. And right now we have a, a board of directors that everybody is super nice, by the book, proper, every, all black belts, you know, one, you know, a great negotiator, a great attorney, a uh, 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 CIA uh, uh, self-defense instructor. Uh, we have another one, computer expert. We got another one who is a socially unbelievable. The guy is a, is a, a public speaker. Mm -hmm. So we do have a group of guys, and they've been helping out the association tremendously. Uh, during the COVID year, uh, we lost only four schools from 150 closed down. Wow. Only four. And they are in the process to go back again. And the uh, yeah, we, we have new curriculums being, being uh, I'm going to implement now. Uh, next week, I'm going to be recording a new curriculum. So we're going to revamp a little bit the curriculum with a whole bunch of, uh, you know, more updating techniques. Uh, we're going to still have the same foundation, but we're going to make a level, level uh, we're going to make a lab, couple levels up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to record the whole curriculum pretty much. Um, we are doing camps in Brazil. I've been doing camps in Brazil since 2009. Oh, nice. Uh, I already took 350 people to Brazil uh, for the camps. And we do twice a year. One is going to be this July, August. That's going to be August, this next August. And the other one is going to be in February next year. We already have people sign up for those two camps. People can just log in, pedrosal.com, and you can see how the, the, the camps are. Friendly, super smart. We take everybody to a tour. We train at the Grace Sumaita, Gracie Petropolis. We have a tons of black belts, coral belts that come to visit us. Grandmaster Alvaro Barreto has been there. Uh, Ricardo Idiot Americano has been there. We have tons of guys that have been there. Uh, Roger Fly has been there. We've got a ton, tons of coral belts visit, visit us. So, yeah, we have a great, great things for this next year now. Beautiful. Awesome. So, Pedro, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Congratulations on your beautiful career and what you established here in the United States, being one of the trailblazers and being able to have, be responsible for so many schools that are able to help out so many people out and change so many lives. So I know that this is your mission and to be spreading jiu-jitsu. So, Thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated. You're more than welcome, Gustavo. Appreciate it. It's always a pleasure and an honor, you know, to try to, to share some kind of the, the back experience, special pride, and uh, make sure that people don't, don't do the same mistakes that we've done in the past. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, uh, every black belt, every single guy that's teaching jiu-jitsu, teaching any other martial arts, my hats go off for you guys. I really appreciate it. Every black belt that's there sharing the art, making a difference in people's life and helping people to cope with any kind of problem and give the strategy for us to win in life. Martial arts, it is, uh, it is the beginning for us to start to understand how to succeed in our social lives. So transfer all the knowledge we have to our social life. That's the recipe right there. Incredible. So I appreciate it, amigo. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll see you all later. Oz. I appreciate it. Thanks, brother.